Good evening, and a huge welcome to our live audience here at Parnassus Books in Nashville, Tennessee, and to our live stream audience around the world who is waiting to hear who is the first winner of the Carol Shields Prize for Fiction. My name is Susan Swan. I'm a co-founder of the Shields Prize, along with editor Janice Sewardney and philanthropist Don Orovac. And I'm going to start by reading an, a land acknowledgement. <clears throat> we want to start by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of this land we have the great privilege of visiting today and give thanks to the Cherokee, Shawnee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creek people who are not only the original stewards of this place since time immemorial, they are also still making valuable contributions to our world and to our lives. Land acknowledgements are only the first step towards the meaningful work of undoing many wrongs. As an organization, the Shields Prize Award is committed to doing their work in a good way as we go forward. Janice Sewardney and Don Oravac and myself started the prize 11 years ago when research found that women authors earn considerably less than men, although they publish every year roughly the same number of books. And they also received a third of the coverage, the book coverage, in newspapers and magazines in both the United States and Canada. And of course, they received only a third of the literary prizes in both Canada and the United States, which is why we decided to work together. We um, had the same problem and we felt we could be stronger doing it as a binational prize for women authors and non-binary writers. However, the Carol Shields Prize for Fiction isn't a grievance award. It is designed to radically transform the economic circumstances of women's authors' lives, and it celebrates the brilliance of women's writing, which is in evidence here tonight. If you haven't read the short list yet, you must. Our three, the three of us, Don and myself and Janice, feel that this is one of the strongest literary short lists we've seen in a long time. I knew Carol Shields, and like everybody, I loved her. And I can say with confidence that she would be very proud of the dazzling writing in your books. We named the prize after Carol because she was a beloved author in both countries. She was also a writer who believed in writing away the invisibility of women's lives. And she had won, interestingly enough, both the Pulitzer Prize for Literature in the United States and the Governor General's Award for Literature in Canada for her novel the Stone Diaries. And inspired by her example, we want to support women writers and non-binary authors at every stage in their career. So we've also started 11 mentoring programs in Canada and the United States, which give grants and residencies to emerging women writers with a special focus on those from marginalized communities. Two of our mentees, our first mentees, are here tonight, and a huge welcome to them, Chantal Rondeau and Salima Turkmand MacDonald. Yeah. 
I was going to make you stand up, and then I thought, no, <laughs> that's for later. Okay, and we're thrilled to award our inaugural prize at Ann Patchett's fabled bookstore, Parnassus Books. She is known for supporting women's writing, and she's one of our literary patrons at the prize. And we're very grateful to you, Anne, for hosting us so graciously tonight. And now I'm going to turn the evening over to you. Hello, and welcome everyone to Parnassus Books and to Nashville. It is thrilling for us here that Susan, you decided to have this inaugural Carol Shields Prize at our bookstore. We couldn't believe it. Uh, <laughs> I feel like you brought the very best of Canada with us. Uh, we, this whole time, and we've been saying, what, they're coming here? Really? That's, it's fantastic, though. We are so, so happy to have you. I want you to know that I got to meet Carol in 1998 when we were both finalists, shortlist finalists for the Women's Prize, which back then we called the Orange Prize after the telephone company. And um, Carol was such a hero of mine, and she won for a book called Larry's Party, which I adored. And the thrill, when I think back on that time, was that I got to meet her. And also it was a very similar thing. There were five of us and we spent all this time together, and we all really fell in love with each other, and we all were rooting for each other, and it was so wonderful. And then, years later, I won that prize, and then years later, I lost it again. <laughs> so, I just want you to know, life is long, and you have so many great things ahead of you, and maybe someday you'll open a bookstore, and maybe someday you'll be thrilled to see that one of your fellow finalists wins another award, and maybe someday an award will be named after you. So it's not just tonight. It's every good thing in your life up ahead, and I'm so proud of the five of you. And I, you know, people say, well, you can't say you're proud of somebody, but you can, because I've just been in that seat so many times, and so I am. Um, and as long as we're talking about people I'm proud of, uh, Melinda Gates, knocking it out, doing good in the world, for women, for literature, for this wonderful prize. And Melinda is going to say a few words to us now. In my work as an advocate for women and girls, I've had the tremendous privilege of meeting with women around the world to talk about their lives. And that experience has taught me what a powerful thing it is for a woman to tell her story. It changes the way she sees herself, and it reveals her own sense of power and agency. And when people listen to her story, it can change the world around her too. But as the people in this room know all too well, the voices of women and non-binary people don't often get the platforms and the recognition that they should. Our world would be a lot more equal and a lot more interesting if they did. And that's what the Carol Shields Prize for Fiction is all about. It's named for someone who used her life and her work to put the everyday experience of women's lives front and center and to make the invisible visible. And it's awarded to women and non-binary writers who are using their talents to tell stories that don't often get told from perspectives that often don't get shared. To the prize jury members, I do not envy the choices you've had to make, because through their work, the 2023 nominees are giving voice to a wide range of lived experiences. They're creatively challenging old narratives, and they're revealing the wonder in the ordinary. One of my longtime favorite books, A Wrinkle in Time, 
says that a good book has the same power as a star. It's a living fire to lighten the darkness leading out into the expanding universe. So to every single nominee, please know what a gift you've given us through the books you've written. By sharing your stories with the world, you're making it a brighter and more expansive place to be. Okay, I have one more task up here before I sit back down, and this one's funny. Um, I'm going to introduce Margaret Atwood. And I would like to say, if there is any person in this room or watching live stream around the world who doesn't know who Margaret Atwood is, <laughs> it, it, no, I mean, that's just not even possible. Um, Margaret Atwood is my hero, is our hero, and is the person who shows us that if you are smart enough and brave enough and talented enough, you can change the course of life. Margaret Atwood. I always have to do that. I'm very happy to be here and to have witnessed these five very talented people in action. And quite frankly, I'm amazed that there is a here for me to be attending. Who would have thought that the dedicated team assembled tonight would pull it off? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not at the beginning, I played at least in my own mind, the part of doubting Thomasina. When Susan Swan first approached me for help, I thought, oh, well, I might as well humor her. <laughs> <laughs> They'll never overcome all the obstacles that wise old biddies such as me know too well they will face. For instance, the anticipated naysayings, such as dismissively, Oh, women, why have a prize for them, the lightweights? Or, more high-mindedly, can't we just have a prize for people? <laughs> or, or more snarkily, women shouldn't be stuffed into some second-rate pink frilly box as if they can't compete with men. <laughs> Indeed, all these naysayings have appeared, but they don't seem to have troubled anyone's sleep unduly. Then there was the amount of money. Holy catfish, that is one <laughs> That is one huge chunk of change. <laughs> Shouldn't it be less? I asked frugally. <laughs> no, they said. If it's less, no one will pay attention to it and it won't sell books. And our aim, leveling the financial playing field a bit, will not be achieved. Well, you won't ever be able to raise that much in Canada, I said, Canadianishly. <laughs> we know that, they replied tersely. But in honor of Carol Shields, it will be duo national. I'm still not convinced. Prove me wrong, I said strategically. <laughs> I knew they would rise to the challenge since the urge to prove me wrong is universal. <laughs> Get to work on proving the handmaid's tale wrong while you're at it, <laughs> I whispered to myself. But there are already people getting to work on that one, I observe. <laughs> Which is a good thing for the Carol Shields Prize, because if the handmaid's tale comes true, there won't be any women writers. There won't even be any women readers. Denied the books of women writers because they've all been declared pornographic, at least in Florida, and forced to read nothing but Dick and Jane, or possibly just Dick. <laughs> or forbidden to read anything at all, women readers will become discouraged or possibly extinct. Levity aside, 
this prize is a pretty spectacular accomplishment. Long, long ago, when many of you did not yet exist, The Handmaid's Tale was shortlisted for the 1986 Booker Prize in England. For a woman then, and a lowly Canadian woman at that, to find herself in such company was very unusual. There was a lovely printed program with the author's biographies. According to my own biography, I had never been born. (laughs) (laughs) Because it was rude to tell a lady's age. I was also the only one of these authors who had apparently never been educated. (laughs) Among the graduates of Oxford and Cambridge, it must have been considered bad form to pronounce the dreaded name of Harvard. (laughs) Needless to say, my book did not win, but then I didn't expect it to. If you set a low bar, you enjoy yourself more because you are never disappointed. (laughs) But here's the magic. Before being shortlisted, my book had sold very modestly in England and had then ground to a halt. But after that evening, it began selling again, and it has never stopped. The Orange Prize, now the Women's Prize, works a similar enchantment. So does the Giller Prize. So does the Pulitzer, which Carol Shields herself won. It's easy to find fault with prizes, but they do work. If by working, we mean improving the job conditions, not only for their winners, but for those shortlisted. Such prizes can indeed change lives. And so may it be with the Shields Prize. I'm very pleased to see it defeating my negative expectations. (laughs) and making it to the launch line, and now at last setting forth on its grand voyage. Bless this ship, I say, and her devoted and hardworking crew, and all who sail in her. Carol herself would have been highly delighted, and that's saying a lot. Thank you. When we think of the big prizes, you know, for a very long time, those awards have not gone to women writers. And they do have, uh, some of them have high purses or the outcome of winning those prizes is uh, an increase in income for that writer. And so the impetus behind the prize and the large purse that comes with it along with prizes for the finalists, which I think is unique actually to this prize, is to, in fact, support women writers and non-binary writers and to create uh, an ethos of of value around their work. And so the prize's intent is to really lift up women writers and non-binary writers and to make them more visible in the mainstream. Throughout our virtual committee meetings, I've been consistently heartened and reassured that the Carol Shields Prize is generously and respectfully addressing a legacy of lack within North American literature in regards to the underrepresentation of women authors and the diversity within that representation. I co-chaired the Authors Committee for the prize, which uh, brought together the jury, uh, selected the jury, and we really worked really well together. Uh, across a lot of uh, differences of age, you know, ethnicity, gender, and so forth. It's not necessarily about the fact that this inequity has been going on for years, forever, for centuries. Um, it's it's about celebrating everything that has happened in women's literature and the and in, in the enormous diversity of women's literature now, and and um, trying to draw more readers into the fold to find out what's happening. The fundamental work of the prize, I believe, goes beyond its invitation, support, and celebration of women writers of North America. It activates the following message with monetary backing. You are absolutely seen, heard, included, necessary, 
valuable and fundamental to the literary canon of today and tomorrow. I really think that she would be very pleased, you know, to see so many women writers working together for a common goal, which is to support each other and to support the future of women's writing and non-binary uh, writers' writing. She would be so happy, and uh, I, I think about her a lot, and when I think about this prize, of course, I just can't help but imagine how just blissed she would be by this and by what's been happening in women's literature over the period of the last decade or so. Was emotional. Man, that got me. Oh. Here we go. It's gonna be slow, don't worry. We're gonna do lots of we're gonna move we're gonna work up to it. So I'm Katharina Vermet, and I've had the honor, privilege, joy of wrangling the beautiful jury into making the decision, making several decisions. Um, I didn't do much other than, you know, pick, you know, take them away from Zoom fighting each other. And, you know, there, we came to fisticuffs a couple times, but, you know, we're, we're all pretty weak. So it, was, <laughs> it turned out okay. We've been at this almost a year. We've had regular meetings. We've had lightning rounds for decision making. We've had beautiful talks that have been way too short on the beautiful books. And it has been my honor, and I'm going to miss this as a process. Um, altogether, we read about 250 books. Now, I'm a writer, so my math might be wrong, but that works out to about 50 books a piece. Five, yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> many of us kept reading, because they were all so delightful, and it was such a joy. And it was a challenge to whittle it down and it, as these things always are, but also it was a great delight because with books, you fall in love. And then you, you know, you're willing to fight your jury mates. And it's great joy. <laughs> so I want to thank um, also Anita Rau Badami, Marilyn Simons, Monique Trong, Crystal Wilkinson, my fellow jurors. It's been a trip. So we're going to go through the authors on the short list in alphabetical order, and we're going to start with Daphne. Daphne Palasi Andreadis, the author of Brown Girls. Born in Queens, New York, Daphne is a graduate of CUNY, Barack College, and Columbia University's MFA program, where she was awarded a Henfield Prize and a Creative Writing Teaching Fellowship. A recipient of an O. Henry Prize and other honors, Daphne's fiction often explores diaspora, immigration, family, and hybrid identities. And our collective, altogether, writing of this book, he said, written with engaging lyrical prose, a choir of unforgettable voices. This highly original debut novel follows brown girls of different ethnicities as they move through their lives in Queens, New York. Reminiscent of classic girlhood anthems, this novel follows Nadira, Gabby, Naz, Tris, Angelique, and others through adolescence with all its tenderness and complications. These girls, the color of 7-Eleven root beer, the color of sand at Rockaway Beach when it blisters the bottoms of our feet, the color of soil. They blossom into womanhood under Daphne's sure hand. Characters mature through all of life's stages, grow apart, leave, return to their beloved Queens. Daphne uses the ear and the heart of a poet beckoning us to read passages out loud so we may commit the lives of these young women 
to memory, even as we try to navigate our own. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you. Please join me. I don't think the jury would have managed to get anything done without Katrina's charts. <laughs> Those charts saved our lives. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Anita Rao Badami, and it is my pleasure to introduce Fatima Asghar, author of When We Were Sisters and If They Come For Us. They are a poet, filmmaker, educator, and performer and the writer and co-creator of Brown Girls, an Emmy-nominated web series that highlights friendships between women of color. Fatima is the co-editor of Halal If You Hear Me, an anthology that celebrates Muslim writers who are also women, queer, gender non-conforming, and or trans. About when we were sisters, the jury wrote, a debut novel written by a skilled and assured hand, When We Were Sisters absolutely dazzles, following three orphaned Muslim American siblings as they navigate great loss and painful comings of age, Fatima Asghar weaves narrative threads as exacting and spare as luminous poems, their fragility a mere guise for their complete, unflinching indestructibility. Noreen, Aisha, and Kosar show us what they truly need to survive, even when everything seems taken away. Asghar's novel is a tour de force, at once stirring and beautiful, breathtaking in its lyricism, and head-turning in its experimentations. Please join me in the Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Marilyn Simons, a member of the jury, and I have to say it was an incredible privilege to partake in this process, and especially in its inaugural year. It's my very great pleasure to introduce Talea Lakshmi Kaluri, the author of What We Fed to the Manticore. Talea's short fiction has appeared in the Minnesota Review, Ecotone, Southern Humanities Review, The Common, and elsewhere. She was born and raised in Northern California and currently lives in California's Central Valley with her husband and her cat, and of which I highly approve. <laughs> so in our, in our mutual citation, uh, the jury wrote, in prose that is both restrained and mesmerizing, what we fed to the manticore Talia's debut short story collection features a cast of animal narrators, each with a compelling consciousness, history, life story, and most chillingly, an uncertain future made precarious by the wars and destructions, environmental and otherwise, that the human species has blindly and selfishly waged. Deeply intelligent, Talia's stories reveal, uh, sorry, revel in fiction's finest superpower, the creation of impossible, improbable narratives that nonetheless invite readers to believe and discover within them resounding truths. Please join me here.
Hello, my name is Monique Trun, and it is my great, great pleasure to introduce Suzette Meyer, author of The Sleeping Car Porter. Suzette Meyer is the author of five previous novels, Monoceros, Moon Honey, The Widows, Venus Hum, and Dr. Edith Fane and the Hairs of Crawley Hall. The Widows was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best Book in the Canada Caribbean region. The Sleeping Car Porter won the Giller Prize in 2022. Suzette Meyer lives and works in Calgary. About the sleeping car porter, the jury wrote, Suzette Meyer illuminates a shadowed corner of the mythic transcontinental railways that stitched early 20th century North America with humor, insight, and prose that evokes both the rhythm of the train and the frenetic, sleepless life of its borders. Meyer creates characters who are literally stopped in their tracks by a force of nature, a mudslide that wreaks havoc with the passengers' lives. Central to the journey is Baxter, a gay black porter who is at once iconic and deeply human, a man who transcends his own time and place to painfully and beautifully inform our own. Please join me on the stage, Zed. Good evening. I'm Crystal Wilkinson, and it's my pleasure to introduce Alexis Shapin, author of Elsewhere. Elsewhere is her second novel. Her first was the well-received Saint X. Her short stories have been anthologized in the Best American Short Stories and the Best American Non-Required Reading. Alexis received her MFA in fiction from the University of Virginia, where she was a Henry Hoynes Fellow. She now lives in Williamstown, Massachusetts, with her husband and their two children. About elsewhere, the jury wrote, impossible to put down until the devastating last page. Elsewhere, by Alexis Shakin, is a haunting richly imagined examination of what it means to be a mother and to belong to someone and somewhere. In shimmering prose, Shaken brilliantly uses the conventions of speculative fiction to evoke a surreal world where motherhood is both the pinnacle of achievement and the thing most feared. In an unnamed town high in the mountains, Hemmed in by white clouds that appear every day at dusk, young mothers live under the constant threat of a mysterious affliction that causes them to disappear abruptly and without trace. Through the trope of motherhood, Elsewhere reveals with disturbing accuracy how a community shapes itself and how it closes ranks against the other. Please join me on stage, Alexis.
Giardini, one of Carol's five children. Uh, two of my sisters, Catherine and Meg, are here as well. And three of my cousins, uh, Valerie, Natalie, and who's the other one? <laughs> so we're uh, Cindy. Cindy's here with, with Rick, who's been our driver. Um, so Mum believed profoundly two things. One is that we're all subject to narrative hunger. We hunger for a narrative. And the other is that we cannot live fully. We cannot live humanly. We can't live humanely unless all of our narratives are heard. Narratives have the power to change the world. Margaret Atwood with The Handmaid's Tale has changed the world and it's also changed how we perceive and read our world. These books are those books, the narratives we need to hear, and they each have, in their individual and unmistakable way, the power to change the world. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you for what you've achieved. You've changed everyone in this room, and as your books are read, that will continue. Thank you and congratulations. Well, thank you so much, Anne, for representing Carol's family and to all who are here. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kimberly Good, the Chief Communications and Social Impact Officer for BMO and a member of the Carol Shields Prize Foundation uh, Board. It is such an honor to be in this room and share the stage with so many distinguished and incredible storytellers. Uh, we are excited to all be here to deliver this inaugural Carol Shields Prize for Fiction to one of these incredible authors. Now, I am particularly excited to be part of this celebration because I have always been a big lover of books. From a small girl in the streets and the neighborhoods of Detroit, I used to love to go to the public library and engage in stories because it stoked my imagination. It transported me to places beyond the scope of my neighborhood. Storytelling also shaped the person that I am. It shaped my career. And being here in this amazing bookstore for this occasion is truly a highlight. Now, I'm proud to be here to represent BMO because as the eighth largest bank in North America, we are the presenting sponsor for this award. Thank you. For those who don't know, BMO has been serving clients and communities for more than 200 years. And storytelling is also a part of our organization. Our purpose is to boldly grow the good in business and life. And we use storytelling to talk about the many ways that we help our customers, our clients, our colleagues, and our communities to improve their lives. So as part of that purpose, we want to create not only a thriving economy, but one that is inclusive of all. So that really resonated with the purpose of this award to drive progress and champion gender equity in the literary world. We are proud to support this inaugural prize and I want to thank all the people we've been thanking uh, tonight. The finalists, congratulations, you are all winners. Uh, to our jury, thank you so much and to all who organized this very special evening. I am so excited about reading all of your books. I purchased them, and I encourage everyone who's listening to do the same. And as you heard earlier, uh, we are very excited to award not only this incredible uh, grand prize, but to ensure that all of the finalists will also receive a financial gift of $12,500 to acknowledge and support your work. We're getting very close to that moment. <laughs> so it goes without saying that we are very proud that the winner of the grand prize will receive a residency at the Fogo Island Inn and a $150,000 prize. Wow. <laughs> they tell me that this is the largest monetary prize for women and non-binary fiction writers in the world. And so I'm going to say it and believe it. <laughs> I can't prove it. 
So congratulations once again to everyone. And now it is my pleasure, and I did not want the responsibility of holding the envelope until this very moment. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm going to open the envelope and for the first time lay eyes on who our inaugural Carol Shields Prize for Fiction winter, winner is. Wow. And you all are fantastic. And this award goes to Fatima Ashkar, <laughs> When We Were Sisters. Um, wow, I am like so shook. I don't even know what to say. Um, thank you so much to the jury. Thank you so much um, for believing in my work, for believing in all of our work, for all of the hours that you spent reading and everything that you did. It just means so much. And to even just like be around you all in your work and, and to be such a big fan, I, I'm so honored. And thank you, Kimberly. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who made this prize possible, to everyone, to Carol Shields family, to everyone who, who participated in making this possible. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, oh my God, to my amazing finalists who I got the sheer joy and pleasure of spending the last two days with and exploring the city with. It's like meant the world to really hang out with you guys and, I'm, I'm, and to be around you guys and to, to just soak up this energy. And um, I just also want to say that um, I'm so grateful and I'm really grateful to my press and to One World and to Nicole Counts, my editor, and my agent, Rachel Kim, for just believing in me and, and really holding me down through this process. And um, this, this book was so difficult to write and so rewarding to write. And there were so many people who just held me down throughout the process, who offered words of encouragement, who offered words of love, who offered care. And that is just so invaluable in, in all of the moments that you think that you can't keep writing. And then there's all of these people who are like, we believe in you if you can get to the other side. And I'm so, so grateful. So thank you so much. Hello everybody, my name is Don Orvec and I'm the chair of the board of the Carol Shields Prize Foundation. <laughs> and I'm Janice Zawerbeny and I'm one of the co-founders of the prize as well. We just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight um, and also thank the people watching from home. Thank you for beaming in and watching this historic moment. We are so excited to be able to share this moment with all of you here at Parnassus Books as well. I want to take this moment to thank the jury who worked so diligently reading 250 plus books, um, getting down to 15 and then getting down to the final five, and uh, to making that wonderful, wonderful choice tonight. We'd also like to thank our literary patrons, our corporate sponsor, BMO, all of our generous donors, and a thank you to Ann Patchett and the Parnassus team here at this amazing bookstore for hosting us. Congratulations to the finalists and to the winner, Fatima, um, of the inaugural Carol Shields Prize for Fiction. This important new literary prize will help raise the profile of women and non-binary writers in the United States and Canada. We'd also like to thank our CEO, Alex Scotchless, and her small but mighty team, who really turned our dream of a literary prize into reality. I hope this prize inspires women and girls to write and create, and I hope it assures a younger generation who are watching their human rights being threatened, that visibility is power. And I hope we can all unite and continue to demand the respect due to all people. The 
This is the important part. The Carol Shields Prize for Fiction is made possible through charitable donations from both Canada and the United States. Small and large donations are sincerely appreciated, and I hope you will consider supporting the organization. Your financial contributions to our work will enable us to encourage and support women writers, not just with a literary prize, but with initiatives at every stage of their careers. You can make donations directly through our website. Uh, many thanks again for coming. And to those of you on the live stream, thank you for uh, joining us, and good night. I know I have one final message for the folks in the room. Um, 